call the meeting to order, please. This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, June 18th, 2020. The time is 7 p.m. Please call the roll. President Sells. Here. Trustee Peters. Here. Trustee Gallagos. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Also present Village Clerk Haley. Thank you very much. If you'll please join us for the pledge. You'll have to pardon me as I, every time I breathe, I can't see anybody <laughs> out there because my glasses fog up. So thank you. Welcome to everybody who is here with us this evening, those of you watching at home. Uh, we have, as you can see, a quite spread apart village board. We have our staff here. We have our department heads here. So we'll do our best to, to move this along and hopefully you'll be able to hear everything we have to say. If you're here with us and you're having a hard time hearing anyone, if you could just raise your hand and let me know. We'll ask folks to speak up a little bit because we are, are awfully spread out. Uh, first up this evening, our presentations and public comment. And our first item is we have an update on police department policies and procedures by Chief Tom Weitzel. Chief Weitzel. President Sells, trustees, and Manager Francis. So in, for, in front of you is a document that I put together um, reference to really um, several issues. One, the tragedy in Minneapolis, and then residents' questions that either have been emailed to me over the last several weeks or have left me voicemails, or in one occasion, a resident came into the police department and wanted to speak to me. And most of them were concerning use of force or what our policy is. And specifically, the number one question that I had from residents was, does the Riverside Police Department utilize chokeholds? So I wanted to go over this document briefly. And if you have any questions, you could ask. Um, first of all, Riverside Police Department does not use chokeholds. It is actually banned. In 2015, Illinois passed a state statute under the Police Reform Act that outlawed it. Actually, no police agency in the state of Illinois is allowed to use that maneuver. Um, we never have had it, and we never have, and it is, it is outlawed in our policy. And really, the, the most important thing that some of the residents asked me is, like, how do we select our officers? So I think I'll start there by saying that we have a police and fire board of commissioners. These are three residents selected and appointed to this board. They do the hiring, firing, and discipline for our officers. It's probably the single most important step we have is the very first step of hiring. So they go through a process of a written exam. They go through a process of a oral examination from the police and fire commissioners. They go through extensive background investigations, um, psychological exam, polygraph exams, uh, a new uh, something called a stress anal analyzer, um, and then there's a new component called a truth exam. These are all independent. The village contracts with an independent company to conduct those uh, exams with the exception of the oral interviews which are done by the commissioners. And once they're selected on a list, it doesn't mean they get hired. Sometimes the village has no openings in three years. That's how long the list is good for. Then there's nobody hired. If we do hire somebody, they go to a 16-week academy right now, three months of field training in the department, and then they go to a shadow program before they can do patrol on their own. And the state of Illinois is uh, already considering extending the police academy for basic recruits to six months. So some of the questions that you see, in fact, all the questions that you see on this document, at one time over the last two weeks were asked to me either by email or, or voicemail. So um, well, I think one really important component is as in 2019, the department had over 4,100 hours in training. That's significant for a department my size. We only have 18 officers all the way right now, all the way up to the police chief. That's a significant amount of training. It's gone up since 2015 every year. This board has supported that. 
I have put those requests in during the budget process for training, and the board has always supported my request for increased training. There's a, a chart in there that shows how the increase has happened from 2015 to 2019. And another really important component is in-service training, so it doesn't stop. We have in-service training um, monthly and sometimes weekly at roll call. And Getting back to our policies, I will say that our policies are developed through our insurance carrier and an attorney. We utilize a program called Lexapol. It is a policy development program that is written by attorneys specifically for Illinois. So whenever there is a statute changed in Illinois, we get a revision. The police department looks at the revision and we can institute that into our policy. Then it is sent back to our intergovernmental risk management agency. They overlook that and then we issue it to the officers for policy. The reason that is is because there's some policies that would not apply to us. For example, we don't have a canine. So when they send us an update in, for Illinois canine officers, we would not institute that policy because we don't, we don't have a canine program. So once the policies uh, meet our requirement or are required by state statute, they're put into our policy manual. Officers have to read it. They check off on it. Each officer gets a thumb drive, and they have that available with them they can keep it in their squad car, they can have it in their duty bag, uh, they just have that available to them. Our general orders and policies are loaded on the officer's laptops in the squad cars. They can be called up anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, you know, one thing that uh, some residents ask me too is what partnerships do we have with mental health services? The two services we use are either The Room, which is an organization in the LaGrange, Western Springs area, they have an office on, uh, down, uh, near the 47th and Willow Springs Road. We, we partner with them for mental health services and counseling. And then from time to time, if we make a transport by our paramedics to McNeil Hospital or Loyola Hospital, we will follow up with the mental health services that the ER would recommend them to. Um, most likely, McNeil Hospital has a more robust program right now. So we do have partnerships with them. We do utilize these mental health services. Um, and we have met all the requirements that the state um, puts upon us. Now, some of that training kind of wasn't, you know, if people think about training, they think about like firearms training or physical fitness. When the law was passed in 2015, it gave each agency in Illinois three years to come in compliance. Some of the training was civil rights, human rights, de-escalation training, mental health training, CIT, which is critical incident training. These were all mandates that departments had to meet within three years. If you could not meet that mandate, you had to ask for a waiver from the police training board and you had to explain why your agency could not meet it. Our agency met those all the way up to the chief of police. Every single police officer in the department up to myself is fully certified and trained in those uh, mandates that took place in 2015. So, my intention is to ask the manager tomorrow to post this document on our website. I want to share this document with our partners. I plan on sharing it with the District 208 Superintendent, District 96 Superintendent, St. Mary's Principal, our Chamber of Commerce, the Library Director can have it available. We'll have it available in our lobby, and I'll have it available for any resident that would like to see it, because I do continue to get emails from residents um, even this week. So that's a high-end overview of this document, and I would be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any follow-up questions um, on the document itself, or even has suggestions for me. Questions first from trustees. Any questions for Chief Weitzel? Um, Chief, you and I both received uh, an email from one of the organizers at the protest we had uh, last week here in Riverside. And she made reference to something that's being called eight that can't wait, eight police reforms that uh, a number of people are, are striving to get enforced. My understanding from looking at this document and from talking to you is that all of those policies were implemented by our police force as, as far back as 2015. Is that correct? Yes, and I shared that. So the, the, the um, march that we had in the big ballpark, the two young ladies that were running that, they asked for the policy. If you remember, I shared that with them ahead of time. 
So they had that, and I gave them the documentation of our certification. So yes, it's a public information. Anybody can have it. Um, and you can even look it up on the Illinois Police Training Standards Board website if your agency is compliant. So we are in, we are in compliance with those requirements and, and those requests, because some, some agencies throughout the United States aren't. When Illinois passed that law in 2015 and gave you three years, pretty much every agency in the state of Illinois came into compliance. That, but that is not the law throughout the United States. Not every state required that that be a mandate. Illinois did. Does anyone that's here with us this evening have any questions concerning this for Chief Weitzel? No? Chief, thank you very much for putting this together. This is very helpful, and we'll make sure it's on the website tomorrow. Thank you very much. Next up is a discussion uh, of the renewal of aggregation program for the electrical load by Ms. Sterling. Welcome back. Please. President Sells, I remember eight years ago, you and I in this very room, there were a couple of public hearings. I don't know if you recall that, but your program since has um, continued to be renewed every few years, and it's been, I think, quite successful. Um, it's been focused on green energy in just a little mini report, reduction of carbon dioxide equivalents over the duration of your program is equivalent to 140 million fewer pounds of coal burned or 315 million miles of an average passenger vehicle driven. So those are just nice things. Initially, it was focused on savings. In the last renewal, um, the rate was about at the ComEd rate, and the ComEd dropped. So right now, the rate, which is for 100% green energy, is a little over ComEd. We went out to get bids, just indicative bids, to see what um, might come, because your program expires in October, and a decision would need to be made at your next meeting should you choose to move forward. So um, I'll direct you to some bid results that received. Um, to receive any renewal, the rates are all higher than the ComEd rate, both for brown energy and green energy. So kind of directing you to a new program that we've rolled out. It's just a little pivot, still electric aggregation, and about 40 municipalities in Comet, Illinois, have established this over the last three years. Um, but to reduce the, rate, the risk rate to zero, this new program enrolls everyone at exactly the ComEd rate, so no one ever for the duration of the program would pay a penny more or a penny less. And we're able to get an even higher um, percentage of green energy, even for folks who opt out, folks who are at ComEd, green energy is purchased for everyone. So that would elevate the village to a ranking by the EPA. You could receive a designation as EPA Green Power Community. You ship some signs you could post up at village on the streets. And it's a nice designation. Eight of the top, there's 11 of the top 16 ranked communities in the United States are, are NIMEC, is the company I work with, are NIMEC communities in the ComEd territory. It's been real popular because, again, exactly at the ComEd rate. And how are we able to do this? Um, rates, uh, residents use electricity differently, so we leave about half the community at ComEd, about half enrolled with the supplier, and the idea is we're able to buy green energy for all. So it's still an opt-out program. It's under the same plan of governance that you currently have. A little bit different, and next month we could present final offers. So I'll ask if you have any questions about what I've said. Trustees? You've always done great work for us, and we look forward to seeing what you have for us next time. It's been a pleasure. So Thank you. Keep coming back. Thanks. Um, I, I, I will address one thing um, that the Village Management Office pointed out to me. There's a civic contribution offered here, and that might beg the question, how is there money involved? Well, we continue the program. Everyone's at the ComEd rate, guaranteed. Um, with the monies, green energy is purchased, and those are um, typically from windmills located in the Midwest, so it's locally sourced. But you can also choose brown energy at that rate and receive a civic contribution with no stipulations as to use and roll out some sustainability project of your own. It's just an option. 
something to think about, but I know you've been um, enjoying that reduction of 140 million pounds of coal being not burned over the last eight years, so <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you very much. Next up, we have a <coughs> farmer's market update by Parks and Recreation Director Malchioti. Mr. Malchioti. Good evening. I just wanted to provide a uh, quick report and review on our first farmer's <coughs> market under the uh, new public health guidelines uh, that are put out by the CDC and IDPH and in line with Governor Pritzker's phase three of the Restore Illinois plan. Uh, an important note, uh, the last time I spoke, is to, is to note that the farmer's market and some already were open under phase two. Uh, it's viewed the same as a supermarket was. It was an essential service. Um, we opened under phase three uh, to provide, so we had more defined guidelines and could devote more time to the planning. Our first market was very successful, uh, but it's truly a group effort. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Amy Jaksik, Deb Garman, Sue Peipel, and the entire Riverside Farmers Market Committee. Uh, their input and insight, along with the dedicated efforts of program coordinator Annie Hanrahan, ensured that the market ran smoothly and safely. We assess every market every year and discuss any changes that can be made, and while there's certainly more considerations this year, in that respect, it's no different. We will have some layout adjustments uh, after week one to provide a better flow, and we're estimating that about five to 600 customers visited the market yesterday. Uh, we did have a couple of individuals um, that uh, had objections to some of the protocols, um, but they did not enter the market, left without incident, and uh, the vast majority of customers at the market were not only thankful and appreciative that we were able to offer the market, but were also cooperative and compliant with all of the protocols. In fact, uh, most of the vendors sold out of their products. So with continued education and communication, visitors will become accustomed to the new layout and protocols. It will only make the uh, market better moving forward. As always, we will continue to, continue to monitor closely and make adjustments based on phasing and any new guide guidelines that come out. Any questions for Dr. Rocchio? I went yesterday, it was really, really well done, I thought. And I, yeah, there was quite a line when I got there. <laughs> how, many, how many people did you say went through? We're estimating between five and 600. 600? My heavens. Which right. is challenging because you, you know, you can only allow so many in at a certain time. It's one-way traffic flow. We actually purchased uh, what they call poly spots, which are just rubber dots that we put on the ground for lineups. So there was only three in line at each vendor. So there was a lot of mitigating factors that slowed the traffic, but uh, lent itself towards safety. Yeah, I thought it went great. Great job done by everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up is public comment. Would anyone like to address the board? Yes, sir, please, if you could go to the podium. Hello, my name is uh, Thomas Weaver. Um, I'm the president of a property ownership and management firm, and um, we own a apartment building in Riverside at the corner of Lincoln and Park Place, 113 Lincoln. I've um, sent uh, um, emails to the board um, yesterday and today about something that just came to my attention yesterday, in fact. I'm speaking to the Flood Brothers um, proposed contract that's uh, on the consent agenda. Um, I don't want to go through all the details unless there's questions, but uh, I tried to provide the details in, in the emails. I know there's a lot of momentum to this at this point, and this is coming up as uh, last minute, but yesterday when I looked at the agenda, I saw that it was on the agenda, the proposed extension. And since we first bought property in Riverside five years ago, we were very surprised to see how expensive the trash hauling cost is for a typical apartment building. 
uh, the cost for our building, 26 units, which it, I consider to be a typical size, uh, are twice as high as what we pay in other communities, uh, Oak Park in Chicago and um, other towns in the western suburbs. And I had um, wondered about it. I talked to some village staff back then, and I never did look at the contract or anything attached to the contract. It didn't occur to me that there was a separate category for multifamily that would distinguish us from commercial. Um, but I came to the conclusion um, that, well, there's a subsidy in place that where the commercial entities subsidize the residential, which sometimes happens, and I thought that was the reason for the high cost. But as I looked at the agenda and then pulled down the contract yesterday and looked at the appendix where the right rate schedule is, I was very surprised to see that there's a category called multifamily that is distinct from commercial. Multifamily like ours uses dumpsters. Uh, just as the commercial does. Yet we're charged not at a dumpster rate, which if we were, if we were charged at the commercial rate shown in the appendix, our costs would be right in line with what we would expect. And I speak on it in some sense for all the tenants that are in these buildings because the tenants end up paying these costs. There is no magical way around that so if we're paying twice the cost that we should, the tenants are paying more than their neighboring homeowners, uh, apples to apples. Um, as, I, as I talked to the village, uh, it was recommended that I speak to uh, Michael Flood, and we did speak this afternoon. I don't know if he's present here. Mr. Flood is here. Oh, okay, very good. Um, and we had some conversations about it. What I am asking, I, I believe, is a simple but significant, it will have submit, significant positive impact, which would be to allow an apartment <coughs> owner manager of that larger size, you have two sizes in your contract. One is, I think, three to seven units, and then the other is eight to above. Well, I think anybody that has an eight unit or above, we use dumpsters. And we would ask that you add a line on that multifamily rate page that allows the owner the option to be priced as a commercial entity uh, or not. We would choose the commercial pricing because we're using a commercial service, which is dumpsters. In our case, with 26 units, we're not, we do not have 26 garbage cans at the rear of the building that have to be picked up individually, which is what the thinking of that rate page assumes. And so they end up with a, a much higher cost than the bulk cost of using a dumpster where it's put in and you're paid by the yard that you have in the dumpster. So that, that's... That's my request. I think it would have a very beneficial impact to other apartment owners and to their tenants. I've been asked by village staff as to, well, they note that I'm the only one that's brought that, this up to anybody's attention, but I think it is a unusual set, you need an unusual set of knowledge to notice that there's something wrong with that pricing, that the pricing is, is if it's calculated that way, it's, it goes way too high instead of being treated just like the grocery store that has two dumpsters or the restaurant that has two dumpsters. We have two dumpsters, and we would like that same kind of treatment. And as I said, we had some conversations this afternoon, and Mr. Flood seemed to be willing to um, work in that direction. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Flood, would you like to address some of the concerns that Mr. Weaver just mentioned? Please, if you could. <coughs> Mr. 
What's that? What's that? Oh, I don't. All right. Uh, good evening, Michael Flood with Flood Brothers. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you for the comments, Mr. Weaver. Um, obviously, this was brought to our attention uh, late yesterday, early this morning. Um, you know, as a, uh, a, a situation um, where a property owner in town had a, uh, you know, a, a point of view on the, uh, the model of the pricing. Um, the pricing has always been in place prior to Flood Brothers coming in. The model that was in place, we've been abiding by the contract. Um, obviously, this is an exclusive franchise contract, so we price things seen fit that that's the model and uh, the price per unit model is used in other communities. Other communities don't get the same uh, incentives that the Village of Riverside does, so there's costs that come in place to offset other costs. Other communities pay the disposal costs uh, for the collection, and that is a factor when things are priced. Um, one of the tough things when looking at it with the incentives and pulling out you know, residents to uh, not receive some of the residential benefits that live in an apartment is we don't have a check-in check-out policy or policing policy on some of the benefits like electronics waste pumpkin composting the shredding event or the ha household hazardous event um, the property uh, in question also has the ability to receive those benefits but also the food scrap collection with the yard waste collection um, uh, so there's incentives there that go on top of the cost that other municipalities, individual contracts between a property owner and its, uh, and its vendor, waste hauler, that they don't see uh, or don't get uh, that the residents uh, that reside or rent property in Riverside do get. So I guess I don't know if that answers fully the questions or the concerns that you might have. But uh. So I guess, I guess what I'm struggling with is Mr. Weaver's point that you know, if, if in terms of the dumpster service, whether a dumpster is behind a multi-family unit or behind a grocery store, right. what's the difference? Why why would one pay more than the other when it, it's not any harder for for you, I assume, to just empty the dumpster, right? Right. So the pricing and the container u u utilization for an apartment bill, multi-family property, the property can receive more containers, more yardage, more collection as needed. Um, in some cases, they need more than, um, you know, the comparable two two-yarders twice a week at the grocery store. You can get four two-yarders two times a week, and your price doesn't change, where if the grocery store got four two-yarders twice a week, their price would rise, because the pricing is all set on the per-unit base, and that's the model that, you know, was implemented into the contract. And... Um, but can I can I just follow up on yeah. that one? Because I think I thought I understood what Mr. Weaver was was getting at was he would have or people in his in his situation the larger multifamily units would have the option to be tr priced as a commercial. So in that instance, they would be paying exactly the same rates as the commercial. So if they had to have two, then they would pay more. They would pay more. So that why doesn't that work then for a multifamily? Well, the model that was in place prior to us, when Mr. Weaver still owned a property prior to Flood Brothers being in here in 2014, was the same model that was put in place, the contract uh, that we you know, were awarded in 2015. It was the same model used. There was no change. We were just abiding by what was requested in the proposal. Some of the costs change, you know, and the incentives change when, you know, you, you start to kind of change because the, the price that uh, that property pays goes into changing it to match the commercial pricing, there's a significant change in revenue uh, that could have a factor somewhere else. Okay, let me hold up. Do any other trustees have questions about this? I, Mr. Hannon, please. I have several questions. I, you know, first of all, I always enjoy public comment. It's nice to get a fresh perspective that might not be um, in the realm of the specialized knowledge of the various trustees. Uh, when I read the comment later from Mr. Weaver, I, um, you know, understand the Flood Brothers' position is that it's a not breaking it down rate by rate, but you're 
looking for an aggregate bid on what it costs to serve this community and, and how that gross number gets divided up between residential houses, commercial houses, apartment buildings, my assumption is you're going to add all those numbers together to get to an aggregate number that makes sense for you to serve this community. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so it's, it's an aggregate set of benefits that the community is paying for and the contract bakes that out. I, I'm struggling with, um, you know, it, it, this uniformly applies to all residential rental properties. There's a breakdown between three to seven units and eight and above, but everybody in the same category is treated the same way. And the, you know, the, the comment that this is paid directly by the tenants, you know, there, there's a profit margin in there as well. So I'm, I'm, you know, if we take money away from what we're gonna charge these multifamily properties, either we're gonna lose additional services, if I'm correct, or the rates go up for somebody else because Flood Brothers has to get to their number. So, you know, if there was a non-equal treatment argument here that, you know, this apartment building costs more than this apartment building, but, uh, you know, I like the comment that this structure was in place in the prior service company that, you know, this is not a new concept. Um, you know, I, I just don't see a willingness to shift costs away from the multifamily properties and then have a discussion either what services are we going to cut from Flood Brothers or whose rates are we going to raise. Mr. Pollock, did you have something to... I guess my only, I don't know that I completely understand the rate structure and how it's distributed. Can you the speak only up, please? comment I may have, the only comment I would have uh, based on what I've heard and what I've read before the meeting is that I would not want to see um, single family subsidizing multifamily. I don't think, I mean, re both residents are equal, should be treated with the same rate structure or similar based on the cost to provide the service. I don't know if that's the case that uh, multifamily is subsidizing single family, but uh, I would want to know that if that is the case, I, I would not agree with that. I didn't, I didn't hear that last part. Said so if if it is the case that multifamily is subsidizing, so to speak, single family, um, I would not agree with that idea. So can you address that, Mr. Mr. Flood? Is is it is it the case that somehow multifamily units are, in a sense, subsidizing services? for single family residences? Yeah, so as Trustee Hannon mentioned, you know, the, the, the pricing that, you know, we came to and then it gets distributed, you know, the way we did it, the incentives that we can offer, it, you know, there's commercial pricing that subsidizes some of the residential, multifamily subsidizes some of the commercial. I mean, it all comes in and then we can offer these incentives. Um, I will say, when we took over the community in 2015 and followed the same model, um, personally, you know, I was pretty hands-on in the transition and had the opportunity to meet with many of the multifamily owners. Uh, everyone saw a cost savings all across the board, as mentioned in previous meetings. And, I, and to this day, we have not received complaints regarding, uh, you know, pricing, you know, structure or people that feel a burden that they cannot pay their bills based on the pricing structure in place. So I think we feel, you know, from that perspective, we've been you know, <coughs> adhering to things and, and you know, offering a competitive, uh, you know, uh, price. Thank you. Mr. Weaver, did you have another comment? Please. Uh, in regard to the, uh, in response to the, well, this has been in place, this model has been in place for a long time. There's lots of things that have been in place, as we know, that we, we, we ultimately learn maybe there's some flaws in it and it sh can be improved. I think this is a, an example of that. Uh, when Mr. Flood talks about how for an apartment building you can have more service in the building, well, the building only needs so much service. We wouldn't want more and more and more. It would be a larger building that would end up with a larger service and the cost then would be relevant to that larger building. Um, 
I think if you put out the information to the, if you pulled the apartment owners and told them, here's what's really going on, I think they would be just as, as stunned as I was when I, when I saw it yesterday. Um, and lastly, the, the tenants are a very important constituency, of course, um, but it's a small portion of the overall contract. I think this small change would not have a large impact on the overall contract at all, and uh, yet it would have a very positive impact to the apartment uh, building uh, group. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Here's Dan. I, I, I guess the, the question I have is, you know, going to Trustee Pollock's question, you know, it's a zero-sum game. They're, they're looking, Flood Brothers is looking for a bottom line number, and, you know, the question I would ask the apartment owners is, you know, what additional services are they willing to cut? Pumpkin recycling, Christmas tree recycling, electronics recycling, what would they put on the table to offset that rate reduction? Or is just just a way to avoid <clears throat> cutting into the margins or having the decision of increasing rental rates to cover it? That's not the. I think we've I think we've aired the various views. Thank you for coming, Mr. Weaver. Would anyone else like to address the board this evening? Yes, sir. Please. Thank you, Board. My name is Colin Hughes. I live at 257 Northwood Road. Um, I'm here today to talk about um, what uh, Chief Weitzel was talking about earlier. And that Can I is ask you to speak up just a yeah, little bit, please? Sorry. Uh, I'm here to talk about what Chief Weitzel was speaking to earlier and um, police policies and procedures in, in our village. Um, I uh, wanted to start by pointing out uh, what Oak Park did earlier this week, and that was adopting a uh, pledge that uh, the Obama Foundation uh, of President Obama uh, put forward um, encouraging communities to uh, evaluate their use of force guidelines. Um, and although I, 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 I know Chief Weitzel and his uh, 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 police force puts incredibly due diligence into the policies that they've created over time. Um, it, it never hurts to give them a second look, and specifically what um, this, uh, they call it the mayor's pledge, but village board pledge would work as well. Um, it uh, commits to involving community members in uh, the review process of use of force guidelines. Um, I understand that we're in compliance with the state of Illinois' uh, uh, policies that they require, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those policies at the state of Illinois are uh, perfect and that they're correct. Um, uh, Minneapolis uh, uh, had one of the most progressive police policies around, and they still had this horrible tragedy occur. Um, so I think it uh, would behoove uh, the village to to take a look into it. Um, uh, the worst thing that would happen is after a review, um, everybody comes away and says what what our police department is doing is perfect and no changes are needed. Um, that That is the worst thing that could happen. Um, the potential upsides are several flaws are noted and those can be addressed and changed and improved. Um, and then secondly, also having to do with um, police presence, I'm a graduate of, of RB, uh, Riverside Brookfield High School, and uh, one of the things that always I found a little bit surprising and a little bit disconcerting is the yearly drug raid that takes place at RB. Um, and of course, as a student, you feel a little bit funny speaking out about it because, hmm, who wouldn't, you know, want to talk about a drug raid? Uh, now that I'm graduated, I, I, I don't feel the same uh, uh, restrictions. Um, what happens once a year, it's sort of an open secret among the students, is you don't know when, but once a year, the police are going to come in with, uh, from the surrounding communities, Riverside, Brookfield, 
um, with uh, their force and canine units and uh, they're going to randomly select a few classrooms where they're going to pull the students out, line them up in the hallway and then have the dogs sniff their bags and, and look for drugs. Um, you know, I, I, they, they never tell the students what's found, what's not found, um, but as per my understanding, there were never any massive fines. There are some marijuana, and, and Chief Weitzel, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, some marijuana, maybe some prescription drugs um, in the four years that I was there and before and after. Perhaps maybe we could look at stopping those uh, as a scheduled thing. If there's a, a reason to do it, different, different story. But to just have it there as sort of a, a yearly thing that happens and, you know, it's going to happen regardless of, of the situation, at the very least, you know, maybe it's not the best use of, of, of our funding uh, to do that. Um, so that, that's my public comment. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. Anyone else? <clears throat> we'll move on now to the, reluctantly move on now to the reports of village officers. And first up this evening is, is my report. And as Trustee Peters mentioned at her last meeting, tonight is her last meeting as a trustee of the village of Riverside. And I, I do have <clears throat> a proclamation that I'm going to read in, in a moment. Uh, that outlines basically the extensive service that she has provided to this village. But what cannot be put onto this paper is what she has given to this board um, through her service, and which has been enormous wisdom, great compassion, and kindness. Um, and she's really been many times kind of the soul of this village board. Um, I'm going to miss her terribly, not only as a trustee, but as a friend. But I'm also very happy for her and her family and their new endeavors. Uh, she is an exemplar of what public service is all about. Um, and I had told her many times that I had hoped that she would be Riverside's first, first woman president. And so unfortunately, that's not going to happen. But um, it, would have been, it would have been nice. So let me just read this before I get all choked up here. Whereas Elizabeth Peters has provided dedicated service to the village of Riverside as a village trustee for three years from 2017 to 2020, and whereas Elizabeth Peters served as a commissioner on the Economic Development Commission from 2011 to 2017, including serving as chair of the commission from 2014 to 2017, and whereas during her service on the Economic Development Commission, Elizabeth Peters led an unprecedented and successful effort to rebrand and reinvigorate economic development and business growth for the village of Riverside, consistently seeking to advance the common good. And whereas Elizabeth Peters has served as the trustee liaison to the Economic Development Commission from 2017 to 2020, helping to advance the village's ongoing efforts at economic development for the betterment of village residents, local businesses, and visitors. And whereas Elizabeth, Elizabeth Peters has selflessly volunteered her time and talent to public service and has displayed great commitment and devotion to advancing the best interest of the village of Riverside and its residents. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the members of the Village Board of Trustees, do hereby express to Elizabeth Peters our sincere and deep appreciation for her outstanding service and dedication to the village of Riverside and its residents, dated this day, June 2020. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say a few words before I leave, since I have this platform, if that's okay. Um, Riverside is truly a very special place. We all know it, right? We all feel it. And you drive down the winding streets and explore our green spaces and architectural gems, and you know you found a place 
like none other. So if there's any message I can share tonight, I want all of our residents to know, whether you have lived here for 50 years or 50 minutes, this is your town, and you are the ones who make it a truly special place. The town itself is beautiful. It's inspiring and vibrant and unique. But the real hidden gem here is the people. The community of people across a diversity of ages, races, backgrounds. They weave a vibrant tapestry of life that is truly Riverside's most precious resource. So for all of those of you out there who are still considered new to Riverside, which after being here 12 years, I recognize I may still be considered new, please know that you have just as much ability to impact Riverside as anyone else. I remember when uh, my husband and I went to the 4th of July concert a few months after we had moved here, um, and we had heard the stories about people living here for decades and, and talking in decades, not years. And I remember walking through that concert and not knowing a soul and looking around at the community that was built and the relationships that were clearly on display there. And I was worried. I w wondered if it would take me 50 years to build those types of relationships. I'm happy to say that's not true, um, that we were able to develop lifelong relationships here very quickly and build community in a very meaningful way. So for those of you who are newer to Riverside, please reach out, get involved, be proactive about driving the relationships around you and this community in a direction that you are passionate about. And for those of you who have been here for a while, please welcome these newer folks with open hearts and minds and help them find their place in Riverside's history. It's clear to me that Riverside has a bright future as you all work together to imagine what is next. I, I want to end by thanking this community, um, the village board and the staff, every single person who believed in me during my time on the village board and on the Economic Development Commission, for the many community members and those deeply involved in the village, even my family, that encouraged me to use my passion and my voice to make this a better place. I'm so grateful and honored to have served in this role. And to the countless friends and neighbors who shared with me their thoughts on how to best represent them over drinks or over, uh, over the fence conversations that we've had, thank you for entrusting me to be the vehicle for sharing your voice here. I've learned a lot through this role, and I'm grateful for the personal growth and the invaluable lessons of service that I am taking with me into the next season of life. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity, and I truly believe that Riverside has great things ahead of it in the future. And just so you know, we purposefully made this agenda really long tonight. <laughs> just for me. Just to uh, keep you here as long as we can. And once a Riversider, always a Riversider. You always have a home here. Thank you. Especially in our hearts. Thank you. Next item of business is a motion to reappoint Andrew Sickwitz to the Riverside Police Pension Board for a term to expire 2023. I'd ask for a motion and a second to appoint Mr. Sickwitz. So moved by Mr. Gallagher. By Mr. Gallagher, second by? I'll second. By Ms. Evans. Comments? Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, that's all I have this evening, Manager Francis. I just have one item this evening. Um, vehicle sticker and pet license applications will be mailed out on Monday. Um, so residents, this is just a reminder that you will not be able to pay for your sticker in person. You have to either mail in or renew online. If you have any questions, please contact the finance department. That is it. So I, I have a question about that. Certainly. So in terms of the vehicle stickers, mm -hmm. you can renew 
online and pay online. Mm -hmm. What about new new vehicles? You will be able to do new vehicles as well, and yeah. Director Jones. You can also renew new vehicles online or print a form for new vehicles that you can mail in. Okay, so this can all be done online. Any changes to a vehicle if you've replaced a car in your fleet? Okay. Um, we might want to do something to make it easier for people to find that particular location on the website. Sure. You know, just so they don't have to kind of search through. Absolutely. Okay. We'll work so. on an e-flash and creating a trending topic and post on social media. Perfect. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up is the approval of the consent agenda. Do, are there any items anyone needs removed for further discussion before I read through them? On the agenda this evening, Approve the voucher list of bills June 18, 2020. Approve the Village Board of Trustee public hearing minutes, Harlem Avenue Business District Number Two, and Harlem B Avenue Business District Number Three, and the Village Board of Trustee regular meeting minutes of June 4. Review and fi file the following: the Economic Development Commission meeting minutes of March 12, Landscape Advisory Commission regular meeting minutes of May 12, the Planning and Zoning Commission regular meeting and public hearing meeting minutes for February 26 and the special meeting and public hearing minutes for March 11. Review and file the community department, <coughs> excuse me, the community development, finance, police, fire and public works monthly reports for May 20, 20. Motion to approve an intergovernmental agreement between the Village Riverside and the Riverside Public Library relative to the issuance and administration of one and a half million dollars of general obligation library bonds. A resolution authorizing the village manager to execute a First Amendment with Blood Brother Disposal Com Company to an existing contract for the collection and transportation of municipal solid waste, recycling, and landscape waste. A resolution of the Village of Riverside authorizing the village manager to issue a purchase order to Client First Consulting Group for information technology and project management services in the amount of $62,447 for 2020. A resolution approving Selborne Road Construction and Parkway Road re Resurfacing Change Order Number Two, not to exceed $147,395 for increased roadbed excavation and insta installation of Tensar Geogrid TX7, and an ordinance amending various sections of the Village of Riverside Zoning Ordinance and Riverside Village Code relative to gravel driveways. I would like a motion and a second to approve. So moved. By Ms. Peters. Second. Second by Mr. Hannon. Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. You know, I, I forgot to give this to you. Can, <laughs> I, can I just sit it right here That's so people can see it for the <laughs> duration of the meeting? <laughs> you can have it afterwards. I'm going to keep it for a while. <laughs> Next up are reports of departments, commissions, and trustee liaisons. Are there any liaison reports this evening? We do have an update on the um, RB High School Public Safety Antenna Repeater Project, Chief Weitzel. Yes, President Sells, trustees, and manager Francis. Actually, this is a positive little information. So as you know, we've been trying to get the repeater system up at the high school for many years. I'm pleased to report that it's complete. So within the last two weeks, the project was completed. Within the last week, it has been certified as being fully operational. That consisted of testing the system itself, testing it through the radio system, and then testing it with the Cook County Sheriff's Police because they are the uh, backbone of the system and the radio towers. The antennas were put in on the first floor and lower level. It will assist every police agency that comes into that high school to assist us, no matter if they contributed or not. If they are on our radio frequency, it will work now. I have shared those documents with the superintendent. I've shared them with the, uh, our neighboring police chiefs and our neighboring village managers um, also. So I wanna thank the board because quite honestly, as many of the board members know, I pushed for this for probably four or five years and I needed help in the end. I needed some political help, and, um, and I needed Manager Francis to work with her counterparts, village managers in our neighboring suburbs, to push it over the goal line. And without that, without that help, this project would not have happened. 
there's no question about that. So I want to thank the president, the board of trustees, and manager Francis for helping me get this through. And um, I just want to report that it is up and fully functioning and it's running. That is wonderful news. And it did take a long time to get this through. But, um, and just to extend your comments, I'd like to thank our neighboring communities that, and the superintendent at uh, 208 to finally get this really necessary safety feature in place. Everyone over there is safer now because of it. And Chief Reisel, I appreciate your perseverance in this. Thank you. If I may, President Please. Sells. Um, well, Chief Weitzel gives me credit for reaching out to the managers. It was really you that facilitated this process. So thank you, thank you for all the energy and effort that you put forth to make the school safer. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Next up is an update on library bond sale by Director Johns. Director. Thank sold the bonds for 1.5 million for the Riverside Public Library. The village received four bids, the lowest bid coming in at a 1.57 interest rate with a premium of $49,000. So this is a, a great benefit for the library and I'm very happy with the rates that we received. Excellent. Any questions about that from anyone? Okay. We'll move on now to ordinances and resolutions. Um, the first item, Director App, is that still alive and well, or? Um, no, sorry, so you can hear me over the HVAC system here. I did receive letters from both Ms. Flesher and Mr. Jindal that if the text amendment was approved tonight, they would like to withdraw their application for the variance since it's kind of a moot point. So they, since it was approved on the consent agenda, um, they're <laughs> requesting a withdrawal. Excellent. Do we need to take further action on that? Uh, Mr. Molina, or is that sufficient? No, the communication is... I can't hear you. No, the communication You have is, a beard. I do. There you go. See the whole thing. Um, the, the communication from the applicants is sufficient, and if the text amendment were to fail, though, it's conditional, so we'll just see how it goes. But I would say they've expressed an intention to withdraw the variation if the text amendment passes. Okay. So at the point that the board adopts it, if it does, it will be officially withdrawn. Okay, great. All right. Next up is an ordinance approving a variation for construction of a fence in the required street yard at 711 715 Arlington Road. Director Apt. Application from Shelley and Bart Richards. Director Apt, could I? I hate to impose on you. Can you? Could you go up there? I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh, certainly. Can you guys hear? Uh, it's be better up there. Yeah, if I you don't mind, would you mind going up? <laughs> All right. Again, if you don't mind. So we've received a petition um, for a variation from Shelley and Bart Richards, which are the owners of the property at 711 and 715 Arlington Road. They've requested a variation in order to install a fence in their required street yard from Lindbergh. Our zoning code specifically states that fences are not allowed in required street yards. Uh, the proposed fence is going to be four feet tall aluminum fence, and it would encroach approximately 12 and a half feet into their required street yard from Lindbergh. The property is actually comprised of two parcels, which creates a um, new zoning lot. The house is located on the southern parcel, and the owners purchased the northern parcel after their home was built. And this purchase created that new zoning lot of both parcels. This is a corner lot, so they do have a street yard both from Lindbergh and from Arlington. Um, their street yards are determined by the location of the house. Their house is approximately 57 feet set back from the property line along Lindbergh in order to place that fence any closer than 57 feet from that property line, they would require a variance. The public hearing was held on May 27th um, before the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, the village did receive some public comment regarding the variation. Most of it was positive and the neighbors were supportive of the variation request and did not believe it would have a negative impact on the neighborhood. There was one comment that was not in favor of the request and they did express some concern about the loss of open space and the view as well as the potential precedent that the variation could set on adding fences in the neighborhood. 
the commission discussed the petitioner's request and the particularities of this property. Um, the majority of the Planning and Zoning Commission agreed that the larger zoning lot uh, with the structure built entirely only on one parcel and the fact that it's a corner lot together created a very unique situation and a practical difficulty in the application of the code. It was noted that this was an extraordinary physical condition that was peculiar to this property. And it was also noted that the proposed location of the fence at approximately 45 feet set back from the property line shows an intention to meet the intent of the code, which is to leave our street yards open. Um, one commissioner, um, Commissioner Miller, was not necessarily convinced this was a unique situation. And although she thought that the request was reasonable, she could not vote in favor of the variation um, looking at the standards in the code. So the Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval of the variance on a vote of six to one to allow that four foot aluminum fence to encroach 12 and a half feet into the required street yard. The ordinance before you would allow that. And once the ordinance is adopted, the village would be able to issue a building permit for that fence to be installed and they would be able to construct the fence. Um, Ms. Richards is here today if you have any questions of the petitioner and I'm also happy to answer any questions you might have. So I'd ask for a motion to approve an ordinance approving a variation for construction of a fence in the required street yard at 711 715 Arlington Road. So moved. By Ms. Peters. So seconded. Second by Mr. Galagos. Are there any questions or comments concerning this? Mr. Hannon? I have several questions for Director App. Um, yes. There, there were notes in the executive summary which was very helpful. Um, talking about that you can't put the fence in unless improvements are made first. And I just want to understand two things. You know, if, if there was a structure at 7-Eleven, where would they be able to put the fence? And number two, if, if instead of being two lots, this was converted to a single lot, how would that affect the analysis? consolidated into one lot, it wouldn't change the situation at all because the setback, again, is determined by the location of the home. And the home is loca located 57 feet from that property line. So I don't believe that that would change the situation at all um, in, in that regards. Um, with something being built on the other lot, so if the other lot did have a structure on it, um, they would be able to put the fence directly on their north property line of the southern parcel. Um, but since there is no principal structure on the other lot, um, you know, they are looked at as one zoning lot, which is both lots. Um, and so again, the street, it's a corner lot then, and the street yard is determined by the location of the home versus it being an interior side yard, um, like kind of your typical interior lot where you only have a five foot setback from your two side property lines. And I, I did not see this in the, in the minutes Maybe I missed it, but w what was the finding on hardship? Uh, the finding on hardship is that they thought that there was um, a practical difficulty with how structures are placed on the lot in this, in the combined lot, the zoning lot in this particular case. Um, they talked about the uniqueness of the combined lot situation, the corner, all kind of creating a hardship, uh, or I, practical I, difficulty in this particular case in the application of the code. I guess I'm confused. So if this was one lot, they'd still have the problem, correct? Yes, but they're talking about the location of the structures on it. So the fact that this house was built completely to one side based on it being an interior lot when the home was constructed, is that combined with them then purchasing or being able to acquire the additional lot um, has created a, a unique situation and a practical difficulty in applying the code. So the fence would still be, you know, their thought was the, sense, the fence will still be 45 feet set back. Um, it's still going to provide a very large so, uh, street yard, um, but they are not asking for some, they are asking for something that, that seemed very reasonable and they did have a unique situation as well as there's nothing they can change about how their property is set up to really change that situation. I could allow them. Um, I think it talks about that in the executive summary. If we were to look at the two lots independently and they were to say, okay, we're never going to do anything with the um, corner property, so the northern parcel again, um, they could put the fence right on their property line that's 
divides the two prop the two parcels and just be we're an independent lot and this is an additional lot that we own but we're not going to do anything with it and then it would sit there as a vacant lot um, and they would not be able to do any further improvements on it if they combine it as part of their property now we're looking at one larger a larger lot okay and, and one last point and really we'd mm -hmm. love to hear from the other trustees uh, you know my, my concern is setting a precedent on any of these one by one zoning changes and it is um, you know, I, I don't want to do something that would provide an incentive to, um, you know, buy, buy an undeveloped lot, one that was previously cleared, and then try to get a special zoning change because it's, the mere fact that it's vacant is the unique hardship that they're trying to address. So I, I, that, that concerns me, I mean, I'm very sensitive to the situation, I, I understand the need for the fence, but you know, every time we have one of these amendments, you have to think broader than the particular situation. And I, I'm just struggling with, you know, how do we approach this in the future if someone else who has a vacant lot next to them, they have a double lot that was never developed. Um, you know, what's the standard there for letting them do something that's not otherwise permitted? Other comments? Mm -hmm. Mr. Pollock? Yes, so I agree with the Planning Commission's recommendation. Um, I do see that this is a unique situation because of the excessive side yard on the property, the area between Lindbergh Road and the house. Uh, that is unique to this property. I don't see that a whole lot in Riverside. Um, and so I, I think that that is a unique condition. I think there is a hardship in that uh, uh, the zoning uh, makes it impractical, if not impossible, for them to make any use of that uh, side yard. Uh, I think in terms of impacting adjacent properties, I think they've taken measures to make sure that doesn't happen. I would note that the fence does not extend forward of the house immediately to the west on Lindbergh Road. So therefore, they're essentially preserving the street yard uh, intact. Um, I think to the extent that it sets a precedent, it's not necessarily a negative precedent. It would only be a precedent if someone had the same exact situation where they had a 45-foot side yard uh, with a house forward uh, in the rear as, as this is configured. So I would uh, support the Planning Commission's recommendation. Other comments or questions? Okay. Please call the roll. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Hannon. No. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Colley. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Richards, for coming. Appreciate it. Next up is an ordinance amending various sections of the Village of Riverside Zoning Ordinance relative to planned unit developments. Director Act. After several months of discussion, uh, the Village Board directed the Planning and Zoning Commission and staff to move forward with a text amendment to allow planned unit developments in Riverside. The proposed amendment includes the following changes. It would add uh, planned unit developments to the use tables for residential and business zoning districts, um, and it designates them as special uses. It creates a new Chapter 13 in the Zoning Ordinance, Planned Unit Developments, that creates the um, procedures and requirements for planned unit developments to allow flexibility in the application of the standards of the Zoning Ordinance based upon procedural protections, providing for detailed review of individual significant proposals that are in the public interest and provide a public benefit. Um, it provides references for the new planned unit development process in the administration chapter under special uses. It precludes single-family residences from being eligible to be considered a planned unit development. It does not have a minimum size requirement for planned unit developments. Um, and planned unit developments are subject to the underlying zoning district regulations unless an exception is specifically granted. Exceptions from district regulations may only be granted if the village board finds that such exceptions meet certain standards or requirements. Um, such as providing a public benefit, uh, promoting objectives of the village, enhancing the quality of the design, et cetera. It also lists preferred design characteristics and amenities as guidance for those looking to do a planned unit development. 
The Planning and Zoning Commission conducted their public hearing on this text amendment at their meeting on May 27th. Um, they did have some small changes regarding clarifying the denial process as well as some of the timing requirements for submittals and actions by either the petitioner, the village administrator, or the village board. But ultimately, they concluded that the proposed tax amendments were consistent with the intent of the zoning ordinance and our um, CMAP CBD plan, and that allowing planned unit developments with standards proposed would benefit the entire village. And they recommended approval of the proposed tax amendment um, on a unanimous vote. The Preservation Commission um, also reviews all text amendments to the zoning ordinance. Um, they are to provide comment on their effect of the proposed amendment on the historic landmark designation of the village or on the general plan of Riverside. And these comments are to be submitted to the village board. The president. Oh, I guess the AC is off. I can move over. <laughs> oh, it's not working. I'm sorry. They discussed this at their meeting on uh, June 11th, um, and they did have some concerns. They were not necessarily opposed to planned unit developments. However, they expressed some concern about allowing them in the single family residential zoning districts and also the lack of preservation commission review of proposed developments. Um, they have submitted a memo outlining their concerns, which was attached uh, to your agenda packet. Um, if the village board would like to make any changes or modifications to address the Preservation Commission concerns, I do have some language prepared um, that could be incorporated um, if that is something that you want to consider. But you do have um, a ordinance proposed before you that does not incorporate any of their changes, but we can make changes to it if you decide to. Why don't you share those with us now? Yes, okay. Before. So one of the areas of concern was um, section 10-13-3, where it talks about the authorization and applicability. And some of their concern was that it was a little bit ambiguous or unclear. So staff thought that instead of having it as one paragraph, it could be separated out. So A would be um, the first sentence, which talks about a planned unit development may be authorized as a special use in any zoning district, but is not authorized for uses involving only a single family home or a single family home and associated accessory dwelling unit. And then have B be the next sentence, but reorganize that sentence. So it would say the requirements of the underlying zoning district in which the planned unit development is located shall apply unless specifically approved by the ordinance granting or amending the planned unit development as a special use. And perhaps that makes it a little bit clearer that the base zoning applies unless the board specifically approves changes or exceptions to it. Um, the other consideration is preservation commission review. Um, that could be added under the, um, let me find the header, so that would be under 10.13.6 procedures under, trying to find my letter. So it would be under C number two, you have A, B, C, which gets you through um, submittals and reviews and public hearings before the Planning and Zoning Commission. But before the Village Board reviews it, we could add a Preservation Commission review, and we could use similar language as we use for subdivisions and text amendments, which cites Section 11-1-4-9, saying that the Preservation Commission shall review the proposed planned unit development and shall um, provide its written comments to the Village Board of Trustees pursuant to Section 11149 of the Municipal Code. And that's where it talks about providing comment on the impact on the National Historic Landmark designation and the general plan of Riverside. So before we get into a motion, let me just ask your, your opinion about just this particular part with regard to the Preservation Commission recommendations, if you have comments one way or the other about that. Just, just a question as far as the ordering of, of the Preservation Commission review, does that come after planning and zoning as their input, I'm assuming? Correct. So if they have comments, it just goes to the board, it doesn't go back to planning and zoning? Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's what typically happens, right? Right. Okay. But the board could send it back to planning commission if okay. it wanted that input. Uh, it just confused its procedure. That's helpful. Thank you. Do I sense a consensus that we would like to include those suggestions by preservation? Yes. Okay. So with that in mind, 
I didn't let me get back to. I would ask for a motion to approve an ordinance amending various sections of the Village of Riverside zoning ordinance relative to planned unit developments, including the specified changes by the Preservation Commission. So, so by Ms. Evans. Second. Second by Ms. Peters. Further conversation? Please call the roll. I'm sorry. Can I just? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hand. I didn't question. see. In in section 10-13-8, and this is more a question on the mechanics than the language. It talks about changes um, during construction. And you know, the concern I have is that we're partially into construction. They want to make a change. You know, through this procedure, the change is rejected, and the developer determines that it's no longer profitable without that change. So then we have a, a sitting project that no one's moving towards completion. What, what, you know, and, and I understand the mechanic of this, that they want to get approval. But what's, what's sort of the procedure to minimize the risk of that happening? Well, there, there really would be. It would just be if they need to make the change that pre presumably the developer would explain that if it wasn't allowed, they wouldn't be able to go forward and you would take it into account in making your decision. I mean, any development circumstances can change and they can feel the need to walk away. But there, and, and I don't need to know the details, but there's a procedure in place that if they'd proactively come to the village, say we need to add this X, Y, Z, it would go through the process and, and then get a, a, a approved. Correct. And then what, what, I mean, as far as envisioning what the timetable that would be, they would need to go back to planning and zoning through preservation to the board? Well, it would depend on whether it was major or minor, correct? Correct. Uh, I was speaking just to major. Yeah, yeah would, you'd have to go back and amend the documents if it's major. Okay. We would probably need to, I'm not sure if we would need to add that. Well, let's see. Um, Preservation Commission review for procedure for major changes. We might need to add Preservation Commission review to number three. Yes, that should be done. Under three, under A, is that A3? Procedure for major changes. Mm hmm it would, we would add, D would now be that reference to the Preservation Committee, and then there would be an E that is the decision by the Village Board. But of course, the Village Board, if it wanted Plan Commission's input, could send it back to Plan Commission. That's helpful. Thank you. That's it. Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Next up is an ordinance amending Title VIII, Section 862, Water Service Charges, and Section 879, Sewerage Service Charges of the Village of Riverside, Illinois, Village Code. Director Johns. Earlier this year, we received notification from the Village of McCook, who we buy our water from, that they were planning on increasing their rates by 2.97%. Before you is an ordinance mirroring an increase in the village rates by 2.97%, which represents a 30 cents per unit increase in the price of water and a six cents per, in sorry, six cents per unit increase in sewer charges for the village. This would be effective June, third, June 1st bills. Um, as a net impact, if you, your household receives a minimum bill, this would have an annual increase of $10.80. If your household has an average bill of 11 units, that would be an increase of $23.76 annually. So I'd ask for a motion and a second to adopt the ordinance. So moved. By Mr. Gallagos. Second. By Ms. Peters. Questions, comments? Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. 
Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Next is an ordinance approving the village, the, um, an ordinance approving the business district plan for the Harlem Avenue business district number two, designating the business district, making a blighted area finding within the business district and imposing a bus business district service occupation tax within the boundaries of Riverside's Harlem Avenue business district number two. Director Apt, that was a mouthful. <laughs> Harlem, the proposed Harlem Avenue Business District Number 2 is generally located on the west side of Harlem Avenue from Shenstone to the north to Lawton to the south and along East Burlington from Delaplaine on the west to Harlem on the east. Um, we've hired Kane McKenna. They prepared a business district plan, which was before you at your last meeting and will be adopted tonight. Um, it has found and identified economic liabilities and underutilization of the area due to improper subdivision slash obsolete platting and defective inadequate or non-existent street layout as the primary findings for a blighted area per the state statutes. Um, we have gone through this process. This is the final step. So we've adopted the ordinance that proposes the approval of the business district plan. We've prepared the plan. We've had um, public notice posted in the paper. We've held our public hearing, which was at our last meeting on June 4th. Um, and now our last step is to adopt this ordinance that approves the, the BD plan, finds the finding of blight, and also um, implements the 1% um, tax. So you have the ordinance before you that does that. So I have to read this one more time. I'd ask for a motion to approve an ordinance approving the business district plan for the Harlem Business District Number 2, designating the business district, making a blighted area finding within the business district, and imposing a business district service occupation tax within the boundaries of Riverside's Harlem Avenue Business District Number 2. So moved. By Mr. Gallagher. Second, Second. by Ms. Peters. Conversation? Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. And lastly, an ordinance approving the business district plan for the Ogden Harlem Business District Number Three, designating the business district, making a blighted area finding within the, with the business district, and imposing a business district service occupation tax within the boundaries of Riverside's Ogden Harlem Business District Number Three. Yes. Your turn. Uh, the Ogden Harlem Business District Number 3, as proposed, is generally located on the west side of Harlem Avenue from Blackhawk Road on the north to Ogden Avenue to the south, and then on the north side of Ogden Avenue from Harlem on the east to Lionel to the west. Again, we are at the final stage of this process. Um, we reviewed a plan and had the public hearing at the last meeting. This plan um, for this area identified economic liabilities and underutilization of the area due to defective, inadequate, or non-existent street layout and deterioration of site improvements as the primary findings for a blighted area per the state statute. Again, we had the public hearing. We've published the public notice in the papers. We're at our last step. This ordinance would adopt the plan, make the finding of blight, and also impose the one additional 1% 1 tax uh, for this district. So I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve an ordinance approving the business district plan for the Ogden Harlem business district number three, designating the business district, making a blighted area finding within the business district, and imposing a business district service occupation tax within the boundaries of Riverside's Ogden Harlem business district number three. So moved. Second. <laughs> My Ms. Peters, please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you for all of your hard work on this, Director App. It was a long road, but I'm glad we got here. <clears throat> Did you guys have Mr. Gallagher? No, I was agreeing with you. It was oh. a lot of work. Okay. We're going to move on now to considerations. <clears throat> Let me get to it here. So our first item is a continuation of the Swan Pond path, path discussion. Director Bailey, you're going to lead us through this. Thank you, President Sells. Good evening, trustees. 
This is a continuation of a March 5th discussion regarding Swan Pond math, uh, path materials. I provided a, what I hope was a comprehensive uh, memorandum trying to pull in all the elements of this issue. Um, I'd like to just hit some of the high points of that memorandum right now, and uh, certainly if there's any questions or uh, you all might be wanting to engage in further discussion. But the current asphalt swamp pond path was installed by the Army Corps of Engineers in 2011, and that was part of the Hoffman and Fairbank Dam removal projects. Um, and in 2019, the village of Riverside received a $350,000 state capital grant allocation for a permeable walking path. And it seems the best um, application of those funds would be Swan Pond. Um, and since the state grants required it to be a permeable walking path, um, we have settled on a permeable concrete walking path is what is in the works right now. That's a $445,000 project. I mentioned earlier that we had a $350,000 grant from the state that leaves a $100,000 funding gap. Uh, two grants have been applied for to fill that uh, grant, I mean that gap. One is the uh, Invest in Cook County grant program and then an IDNR grant program. Um, the earliest that either one of those grants would be awarded would be the fall of this year for uh, a project in the uh, following year. And of course, a grant is a uh, bird in the bush, it's not a bird in hand, so until you have it in hand, it's awarded, you don't know if that fund is, funds are going to be available. Um, Current, so currently we are, we are on track to construct a permeable concrete walking path in Swan Pond during 2021. Um, hopefully a grant will come in to uh, you know, fall into place to help fill that uh, funding gap. Um, I did identify a couple of potential alternatives for the <clears throat> state grant um, award. Um, one would be to build simply a, an exposed con aggregate concrete path through Swan Pond. That would be less than $350,000, that project. Or to um, apply those funds to reconstruction of parking lot eight, which is off of uh, East Quincy Street, adjacent to the railroad tracks. Also a project that would be less than $350,000. Either of those two options would require state approval. Um, the village would have to go back to, I assume, the legislature and say, in fact, we would like to use these funds for some other purpose, and I suppose you cannot um, count on that until it's finally approved also. So uh, from my standpoint, uh, one of the questions at the March 5th discussion was a concern about the durability of um, path materials. I'm very satisfied that the best option as far as durability goes in Swan Pond is a concrete uh, material, whether it's uh, this permeable concrete or exposed, con uh, exposed aggregate concrete. Um, it could also be augmented with uh, reinforcement to make it even stronger. But the uh, asphalt path, which is about 10 years old now, uh, has not been directly affected by Swan Pond flooding. Like I mentioned in the memorandum, the um, effect on that asphalt path has really been from erosion of the surrounding soil, which undermines the, uh, the asphalt and causes it to break off. Um, so that, um, that is what I have for you if you have any discussion or just uh, further direction, you can, uh, you know, follow through. I, I guess my first, if, if I can just have one to start off here. So there's really no benefit to having a permeable path in Swan Pond, given that it's in no. a floodplain and immediately drains yeah. anyway. Not at all. Right. So we would be overbuilding or overpaying right. for a project that really has no effective use. That's correct. So, 
so your recommendation is the exposed aggregate concrete path. Well, if, I was, if I was going to choose myself uh, a path material to replace the existing path, I would choose exposed aggregate concrete because of its durability and the aesthetic aspect of it. Um, it's still a concrete sidewalk basically through Swan Pond, but that would be my choice. Um, but that's not, again, we have funding that's kind of tied to the permeability aspect. Um, but if, you know, like I say, if just without those other factors, I would choose uh, exposed aggregate concrete. I mean, I think, you know, my suggestion would be because the, the, the funding that we got through the capital bill, I think, was, I don't know how big an issue or how big a, a, a factor the permeability aspect of it was. I think it probably was a fairly important aspect of it. Um, the uh, parking lot eight would be a, a far better use for permeable pavers because we actually have a water retention issue over there. So my suggestion would be for us to go back to, to um, Representative Zaleski and see if that funding could be moved and, and be allowed to be used for a permeable lot in, in lot eight uh, and then move forward to see if we can find some grant funding to assist us with the uh, exposed aggregate pathway through Swan Pond. So that would be my suggestion. Trustees, what do you think? I, I don't know if I missed this, but can you tell me how much the uh, exposed aggregate would cost? I don't I've, have a precise estimate, but okay. it's less than $350,000. Both of those projects, the parking lot eight reconstruction and the exposed aggregate concrete path through Swamp Pond would be less than $350,000. Okay. But we don't have the grant to cover that if it's exposed we, aggregate, right? We have the state DCEO grant of $350,000. It's been awarded to the village mm -hmm. at present. So that funding is available if it's permeable. If well, if the state allows the use of it for oh, okay. either permeable parking lot or okay. a non-permeable uh, walking path through Swan Pond. So that's the key: is state authorization. Right. Okay. Thoughts, Ms. Evans. I'm sorry if I missed this, but did you say there is a life cycle for this grant? Do we have to spend it in this fiscal year, or usually they're a year long? Yeah, the, um, the state appropriation that was awarded in 2019, we have two years to use that. So we have to, the, the project, a project, has to be completed during 2021. And these projects are really timed to take place during 2021 at this point. So basically, I could go to uh, Representative Zaleski and, and just ask him what he thinks the possibilities are with regard to this funding, whether um, you know it could be used for the the aggregate, which is going to be less, however, than three hundred and fifty thousand. So, in terms of the village getting the most benefit from the the grant, the capital bill, it would make more sense to use it on a project that matched its figure. Yes, sir. Please, Mr. Pollock. Yes, a couple things. I would agree that um, switching the funding to Lot 8 is probably a greater public benefit right now. Um, and I have to apologize. I must have missed a meeting or missed the discussion. I did not realize we had approved the permeable concrete for the Swan Pond path. My, my, my fault, and I apologize. I wouldn't want to see anything in Swan Pond other than limestone screenings or exposed aggregate pathway. Um, I think the asphalt pathway that's there now is inappropriate. Um, I agree with that. I mean, I, I mean, Director Bailey and I talked about the, the limestone chips and stuff. I mean, there's a lot of baby strollers that go through Swan Pond. True. You know, a lot of bicycles, right. even some wheelchairs that it's not the easiest thing in the world to maneuver through. So, and, and I agree with Director Bailey in terms of the aesthetic aspect of it, the, the exposed aggregate, I think, would, would be the most appropriate down there. And it keeps with the existing sidewalk structure we have throughout the village. Mm -hmm. Do I, am I seeing nods, nods of agreement to that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
uh, let's move forward with that that plan, and I'll contact uh, Representative Zaleski and, and see what his thoughts are on the moving the funding. Okay, thank you, thank Director. You. Next and last is a continued discussion regarding a proposed communication tower located at the Riverside Public Works facility for the purpose of reading water meters and providing enhanced connectivity between the Village Hall and Public Works. Ms. App, you're going to do this one? Yes. Can you hear me okay from this side? Yes. Now okay. that this is off, yes. So um, at your February 6th meeting, um, staff shared with you a need for both a new water meter system as well as better communication and data transfer between the Public Works facility and the Village offices. Both needs will require a communications tower to be installed at the Public Works facility, and in order for that tower to be able to read the entire village um, for a water meter system, that tower's height would need to be 100 feet tall. The proposed um, tower would be a triangular shape uh, that would taper from a diameter of about 8 feet 9 inches at the base um, down to 2 feet 9 inches at the as the elevation climbs to 60 feet. And at 60 feet, that tower would be that uniform diameter of 2 feet 9 inches from 60 feet to 100 feet. Um, this particular type of tower is made of galvanized steel. Um, as far as the data transfer, um, being able to have an antenna over at Public Works that provides a line of sight to the village offices is going to enhance our data transmission and increase the speed at which Public Works staff can work and utilize the various programs um, that the village has purchased over the past couple of years. Um, having that tower will also, also provide um, for additional capacity to meet any future communications needs that we have. Currently, the tower that we have at our village offices is at capacity. Um, a communications tower does require a special use permit, and that was part of the discussion that we had on February 6th. Um, some of the trustees expressed some concern about a tower um, that would be extending 40 feet above the tree line and um, that this could be a problem or issue with the residents um, and community input was going to be very important as part of that special use process. <coughs> it was suggested um, that any property owner within 250 feet of Riverside Road be notified um, as they would likely, most likely be the most impacted by the presence of the tower. And it was also suggested that the fire department park a ladder truck um, at the proposed location with the 100-foot ladder fully extended so that residents um, could get an idea of how tall the tower would be. The village board directed staff to <coughs> replicate the view of the proposed tower using the fully extended fire truck ladder and to take photographs for to have further discussion on notification and moving forward with the tower. So back on March 4th and 5th, we did just that. Uh, the fire department parked the ladder truck near the southwest corner of the public works facility as this is really a more preferred location um, for the proposed tower. This location was selected to limit the views of the tower for residents. Um, this ladder is extended to at full 100, 100 feet and trustees and staff were able to view the area between 5 and 6.15 p.m. Staff was able to take some photos from Riverside Road. It was noted that the only area that the ladder was visible was from between Gage Road and Olmstead Road on uh, walking along Riverside Road. However, this was before the trees had leafed out, um, so the ladder may not be visible at all now that the trees have le leafed out. Um, staff is looking for direction from the Village Board on the following items. Based on the ladder truck demonstration and staff's previous outlined need for a communications tower at the Public Works facility, does the Village Board want to move forward with a special use permit request for a communications tower at Public Works? Based on the ladder truck demonstration, would the Village Board like to pursue locating the tower at the southwest corner of the property where the ladder truck was parked and is further from the river? And lastly, based on the ladder truck demonstration, who should be individually notified of a public hearing? The code requires notification of all property owners within 250 feet of the subject property. Given that the Public Works facility's location is adjacent to the river, 250 feet to the east would not include any riverside properties. So two options could include notifying all property owners within 250 feet of the Riverside Road right-of-way. Um, riverside Road extends from the BNSF tracks on the north to Lionel Road to the south. The other option would be to notify all property owners on Riverside Road from Gage Road to Black Hawk slash Lionel Roads. And this is based on the demonstration as this appears to be the area where the tower was the most visible. Okay, so why don't we start with the second item, which 
kind of has to be decided before we consider the other two. So based on the ladder truck demonstration, would the village board like to pursue locating the tower at the southwest corner of the property where their ladder truck was parked and is further from the river? What do you think? I, I'm in favor of it. I drove past there when the demonstration was going on. I know this is a need that the village has, and I didn't think it was that, uh, you know, it wasn't that offensive to me. So I think we should, I think we should move forward with uh, at least allowing this and, and with the special use permit. Chicago, did you say have something? I also drove by, I didn't really see it through the through the barren trees, um, that does seem to make the most sense, that location. So I'd be fine with that as well. What does this side of the room think? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so uh, based on that, then I assume then we do wanna move forward with the special use permit process. Yes, and what do you think in terms of, actually I, I think maybe I'll punt this one to our village attorney in terms of the, the notice do you have do you have any thoughts on which would be better or so both or legally not really because your code's pretty specific uh, but I would say taking the taking the the boundary of the river or uh, and then going 250 feet probably makes the most sense because it kind of mirrors the 250 feet but you're transposing it to account for the open space of the river but there's no specific answer that this would be legally better it's a policy consideration really looking at the um, second alternative which is uh, properties with Riverside Road frontage from Gage to Lionel it looks a little arbitrary to me um, because certain properties you know there's I think nine properties that are covered here and you know there are properties right to the to the left and to the right of those that probably have very similar views that just because their address is on a different road it looks like they're not so i would i would agree with the 250 it seems a little bit more less arbitrary so you're saying you, you favor the first option correct yes which is more inclusive in terms of the notification process. More inclusive would be the first option. Okay. And it seems to me that we should always err on that, that side to make sure that we've given notice to the maximum number of potentially impacted residents, right? Do I see yeses for that? Okay, so yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Pollock, yes. So the, the, the question is additional notice to those people in the first alternative that would be in addition to the 250 feet surrounding the property correct so we'd still notify those west and south correct. yes okay. okay so you got what you need I did thank you okay much. great all right so <clears throat> anyone have, have any new business I would like to Planning and zoning did discuss a cell tower issue a couple of years ago, right? The small, small cell. Yep. Yes. And and what was the takeaway from that? I mean, I was on the board at that time. Manager Francis, you want to? For small cell or for cell towers? I believe cell towers. Cell towers even predates me on that discussion. Director App, do you recall anything from your historic files? For communications towers, those are considered separately from small cells. So those are two different issues. So this is a 100-foot tower um, and is a communications tower, not a small cell. And so it would fall under our telecommunications requirement in the zoning ordinance, which requires a special use. Um, the only change that was somewhat recently made to that by the Planning and Zoning Commission was to allow um, attached wireless facilities in the B2 district. I can't remember if it was just the public use zone. I feel like it was just the public use zone that they were allowed in. Um, otherwise, attached or detached wireless communications facilities are special uses in 
our residential zoning districts, which the Public Works Department is technically zoned residential. And, and that actually ties into we're limited in what we can regulate on the wireless, the small cell wireless. Yes. By federal and state law. We have new, no new business. I'm going to refuse to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Uh, there, we do not have a need for an executive session, so that I ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. So moved. By Ms. Peters. I'll second. Second by Mr. Galagos. Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Godspeed to the Peters family. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.